Hey, this is Pastor John. Thanks so much for tuning in to either download or stream this study. Uh, we pray that this blesses you. There are a couple of things that we would like to lay before you quickly. Uh, number one is that you would consider this message supplemental in your walk with the Lord, that in no way would it replace either your being plugged into the church at the local church level or you listening to your local church pastor who has been charged with the care for your soul. Having said that, we do pray that um, this study of God's word would, would help you see and savor the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we would pray also that if, if this ministry blesses you, that you would prayerfully uh, consider supporting VXV. And if you do, you can do so by clicking on the link below or by going to our website at vxvchurch.com. Now, I pray that God stirs your affections for Jesus Christ as you, as you dial into now the, the proclamation of God's word. All right, well, good morning, Verse by Verse Church. Let's open our Bibles to the very first chapter in the book of Galatians. Great to be here with you this morning, Galatians chapter 1. And we made it down to verse 10 uh, in our very first time together here in the book of Galatians. Now, you remember from our introduction that, that this was a very serious letter from Paul easily his most aggressive because it dealt with the first major departure from the proper theology of salvation, of course, an issue that can hardly be surpassed in importance. You also remember that this is a letter quite a bit different in its audience. This is not Ephesians or, or Colossians or Philippians that was written to a single church, but this was the earliest written epistle in all of the New Testament written in 49 AD that was addressed to a whole region of churches there in the Roman province that was once known as Galatia. Now, in the interests of getting right up to speed straight away here, here again is the thrust of what we dealt with the last time we were together, that this is the problem in the Galatian churches. Paul says, I am astonished, amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ. You're quickly deserting him for what? A different gospel, which is really not a gospel, right? Which is really not another. Only there are some false teachers, Judaizers, who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of grace, that they're giving them insecurity as to their salvation. That's the problem right there. Now, you remember Paul had established this body of churches there in Galatia upon his very first missionary journey, and almost immediately after he and Barnabas uh, their departure out of there, right? They had very quickly deserted what they were preaching. They had deserted this true gospel of grace for a different gospel. It is how quickly that these guys departed the, the true gospel that has my attention by way of introduction this morning. This word for quickly here, Okay, this is a tacheos. It's where we get our word tachometer from. It is a term of velocity. It means soon, quickly, shortly, suddenly, hastily. It means rapidly. It is a term of velocity. So these guys did not eventually abandoned the true gospel of grace, and then slowly but surely found their way back to the works-based performance religion uh, of the Jews once again. This wasn't, wow, we were saved by grace alone. Isn't this awesome? And then two years later, they end up enslaved to works all over again. No, no. These churches were established and saved on the rock-solid ground of grace alone, by faith alone, in Christ 
Christ alone. And then the minute Paul and Barnabas are out of there, false teachers fly in there and try and rip these guys from their roots. Very quickly, with great velocity, tacheos. And Paul is now amazed, astonished at these philosophies. These guys are bolting, literally, as Paul is writing this letter. Now, what we are going to be dealing with in the text today is Paul is going to take up as his mantle the defense of his apostolic authority for now the remainder of chapter 1. And the reason he is going to have to take up this mantle is because of how fickle these Galatian Christians are. There is a velocity with which they departed because they were, as I mentioned the last time we were together, a people very easily swayed, right? A very fickle group of believers. James might say that they were uh, easily driven and tossed about by whatever currents of doctrine uh, happened to be in front of them, James 1. What Paul is dealing with here is a, um, a, a very theologically mercurial people, okay, that they will take on the temperature of whoever they happen to be surrounded by. They were chameleons, okay? And I believe this is because culturally they were a very capricious people, all right? Culturally, this is just sort of who they were. And so I'm going to tell you a little story because although we focused almost exclusively on the theology of Galatians the first time we met, as we should have, right? This week, I want to bring you into the culture of these people. So we're going to spend a little more time by way of introduction to understand the people now on whom this theology uh, is impacting. And I, and I think it will set up, if we understand this culture, I think it will set up very well for us the necessity for the Apostle Paul to bring forth a defense of his apostolic authority to recalibrate, if you will, the thermometer uh, of these Galatian churches. And so I'm going to tell you a little story that I find fascinating. I hope that you do as well, because we see this fickleness even in the planting of these Galatian churches that Paul brought about in his first missionary journey. Now, the word Galatia, it means land of the galley or land of the Gauls, okay? And there is much written about the Gauls historically. The Gauls were a Celtic people. Uh, They had originally settled there in Scotland and Ireland. And eventually there was this exodus of three major family groups that migrated to the east, okay, who who would eventually uh, be hired as mercenaries to fight Rome, who would eventually conquer that whole territory that, that we now know as central Turkey today. But Rome had a lot to say about the Gauls. Okay, Gaul, Galilee, Galatia. The the, uh, the the Romans thought of the Gauls as really the um, uh, original hillbillies there in Europe, if you will. And, and the Gallic people, they they had developed a reputation of a people that did not have strong minds. Okay, now. It, You know people with strong minds, right? I mean, they sink their teeth into something, and they are not going to stop until they see it through. They're just very strong-willed people, like type A pit bulls, right? They get on the scent of something, and they just refuse to get off of it. Well, that was not the Gallic people. These people were as flighty as the day was long, all right? Julius Caesar had said of the Gauls, you cannot trust these people. You do not want to enter into any kind of a contract with these people. You are going to have to threaten them within an inch of their life in order to get them to keep their promise to you. They were strong physically. They were tough, but they were a very weak-minded, fickle people. And now, when you go into Acts chapter 14, you can see how this fickleness had bled into these Galatian churches. Very interesting. Now, Lystra, uh, this is one of four uh, Galatian cities 
uh, that we know of from the book of Acts. Uh, these here are the ruins of Lystra. Of course, this city doesn't exist today. And now we suspect that this very road right there is the road that Paul and Barnabas traveled on their way to Lystra. And what you have to remember now is Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derby. This is where Christianity first began to spread out into the Gentile world, right? And so I, I want you to picture this in your mind. Get with me here. Let's use our sanctified imaginations. You've got Barnabas. He's a great big guy. Okay, and you've got Paul, he's a little bitty guy, and they show up in Lystra, probably not well-dressed, all right? I mean, they're missionaries scraping by here, and they roll into the city gates of Lystra now, and we pick up our little story in Acts chapter 14. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, notice, who had never walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, Saul said with a loud voice, stand upright on, the, on thy feet. And he leapt and walked, shot right up. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying the speech of Lyconia, oh my, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men, right? And they called Barnabas, big guy, Jupiter, and Paul, little guy, Mercurios, or Mercury, because he was the chief speaker. All right, so, so interesting event, right? Paul and Barney roll into town. Paul sees this crippled guy, yells at him, right? Hey, you, yeah, you stand up. And the guy who never walked a step in his life just shot right up and started walking around, right? What is a little bit bizarre is the Lyconian reaction to the miracle. That They don't say, wow, we, we've got a miracle worker here, right? Or, you know, wow, did you see what those guys just did? But, but rather they say, would you get a load of this? We got a couple of gods that just drilled into town. Now, maybe that sounds strange to us, but it is not strange at all if you understand a little bit of the history of the Gauls, a little bit of the folklore of the Gauls. Now, the two main gods in the world at this time, well, they were Jupiter, a big god, and Mercury, a little god, big planet, little planet, right? And as legend had it, it was in the temple there at Lystra, all right, that, were, that, that you had these two huge trees, okay? And their folklore was this, that, that one day Jupiter and Mercurius, of course, that's Latin for Zeus and Hermes, all right? Uh, but one day, Jupes and Mercury, well, uh, they were evidently bored, and, and legend has it, they came down from heaven incognito as a couple of homeless guys to pay the city of Lystra a visit to see if there were any good people there. So they were, they were going about town asking for food and shelter, but nobody would, but nobody would help these guys. Everybody was blowing them off until they came to an elderly couple by the name of Philemon and Baucus. All right. Uh, that, that took, this elderly couple had taken a very deep interest in them. They took them into their home. They fed them. They took care of them. And so Jupiter and Mercury said, all right, we're, we're going to tell you who we really are. And so they reveal themselves to this elderly couple, and they go and wipe out completely the rest of the population in Lystra. Then they turn to the old couple and say, well, what would you like us to do for you? And they turned them into a couple of trees. Not my idea of a blessing, probably not yours either, but, but evidently they desire to, to live together. Okay, bam, you're a couple of trees. And you've got these two trees entwined there in the temple. And so these two giant trees used to be Alan Carroll, I guess. I don't know. But <laughs> Now back to Acts 14. So, so imagine you're an ex-14. Imagine you're just this idiot pagan hanging around by the city gates, right? All of a sudden, you got one big dude, and you got one little dude rolling to town. They're not dressed up real nice. 
and they heal this guy that's been crippled since birth. Well, well, with that legend swimming around in the back of your head, where do you suppose your mind is going to go? Well, the boys are back in town, right? I mean, that, that's what you're going to be thinking. And if you keep reading there in Acts 14, they run down to the priest at the temple of Zeus and they say, hey, the boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. And then they whisper, the boys are back. The boys are back. And then there's a guitar solo right there. No, I'm kidding. But the priest of Zeus goes and drags a couple of animals down Main Street there. Hey, hey we want to worship you guys this time. And Paul and Barney are going, look, look man, back off. We're, we're just men. Right? We're, we're, just, we're not gods, but we are here to turn you away from all of yours to the one and true living God. Now, now, all of that, all of that was in the morning, okay? Well, then that afternoon, down in verse 19, very same chapter, Acts 14, Jews from the other Galatian churches in Antioch and Iconium come down and they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city and left him for dead. Now, I don't know where Barnabas stuck out to there, but isn't the Galatian behavior interesting? One minute you're a god in the morning and then just a couple hours later in the afternoon you're stoned and left for dead. Now, that is the dictionary definition of a group of very fickle people. Interesting story. Indeed, but that historical mythological context certainly helps us to understand Acts 14. And what it also does for you and I is it really props up our understanding now of number one, why and how these people so quickly turn to another gospel. And number two, why now Paul had to mount this very aggressive defense of his apostolic authority. The very weak minds of these believers needed to be swiftly and aggressively reminded and rebuked, okay, for wandering off the reservation of the true gospel with such velocity. And so I think what we're we're also going to discover is just a very rich setting uh, for you and I to learn a whole lot more about the Apostle Paul and a whole lot more about his God. We get after it and go to work now here in the 10th verse of Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10. Let's roll. Verse 10. For now I am seeking the favor of, I'm sorry, for am I now seeking the favor of men? Or of God? Or am I seeking to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. And so the very same theme continues, right? If you were here last week, verse 11. For I would have you know, notice he calls them brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. When he says, I would have you to know, underline that word, no. He really wants them to know. Verse 12, for for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. There's a triplicate denial here that this came from men. But where did you receive it, Paul? He tells us, I received it through a apocalypsis, a revelation of Jesus Christ. All right. Now, Paul is going to go all autobiographical here, beginning in just a bit in verse 13. What we can deduce rather easily from the text we just read is how these Judaizers, remember last week, how these works-based false teachers here were given insight into how they attacked Paul, right? And therefore, why he is going to be mounting his defense. Now, to begin, these guys were saying, Hey, man, don't listen to Paul, all right? He's just trying to please men. He thinks it will be easy for you, easier for you if you don't have to do rules. And of course, he's right. Uh, But again, uh, get last week's study if you missed it. They do not understand the gospel of, fill in the blank, grace, right? This semi-Pelagian idea that somehow God needs you to close the deal on your salvation with your own good works. This idea that you have to add to the work that Jesus said it is finished, 
right? John 19, 30. That is nothing more than a patently pagan idea that attacks the sufficiency of Christ's work on that cross. You are taking the position that he is not enough and you would be wrong, all right? Again, very important. Go back and get last week if you missed it. That, that, that was foundational, but we're going to get back to that over and over again. Now, here, however, uh, Paul, he really closes the door uh, pretty hard on this argument that he's trying to please men right out of the gate here. Now, if verse 10 is broken off and part of the earlier paragraph in your Bible, it's because that's where it probably belongs, Okay. It's the first verse that you and I are reading today, but it caps the previous nine verses. Now notice the conjunctive particle gar there in the Greek. We've seen that many times before. It means therefore. It is telling us what I am saying is connected to is the result of what I just said. What did he just say? Well, you remember they were pretty strong words, were they not? Look with me in your Bibles from verse 6 to 9, right before verse 10. He said, I am astonished at the velocity with which you people de deserted the true gospel. Now, now you listen to me. And, and this is just his intro, right? Like, you listen to me. If anybody, I don't care if they're sprouting wings. If anybody comes to you with a works-based gospel, a different gospel, they are to be anathema damned, doomed unto eternal destruction. Now, does that sound like a seeker-sensitive sermon to you? Does that sound anything like people pleasing to you? No, it does not. And so Paul slams the door fairly definitively on this ridiculous claim of the Judaizers. Now, so not only is he not trying to please men, but he really wants them to know, really wants them to know, nothing concerning the gospel he has preached to them has come from men. Okay, you and I need to get this too, right? Nothing of what we're reading has come from men. That's huge. When he says, for I would have you to know, and then, again, quick sidebar, I suppose, he's still calling them brothers, Right? They need correction. He's being firm with them. Little tough love here. We need that sometimes, don't we? But, but they're still his brothers. Adelphos, a term of affection there. All right. But he really wants them to know something. Now, that word for know, uh, let, let's get that in here. Did I not get that in here? Where? There we go. That word for know there. All right. A very aggressive word, very strong Greek word there, norizo. It's where we get our word knowledge from, but, but it means to make known with certainty, okay? A aggressive, emphatic. The idea with norizo is Paul is saying, let me make this perfectly clear to you guys. I do not want any misunderstanding at all on this issue. That, that's norizo. What does he want them to really know? Well, Hey, I did not get this gospel from man, all right? I did not get this sermon on the internet. I did not get my gospel from Bible college, nor was I taught it, right? Well, where did you get it then, Paul? And this is what he really wants them to know. This gospel is not of man. I received this gospel through the direct revelation of Jesus Christ. Christ. And every word you're reading in this Bible, every word that we gather here is coming by the direct revelation of Jesus Christ through whatever inspired writer he happens to be uh, manifesting authorship of that work through. Here it's Paul again. So Paul really wants them to know, and God really wants you and I to know, that this is the direct revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, that word for revelation before that is apocalypsis. We get our word apocalypse from this etymologically, but it's not what we think it means, all right? Apocalypsis means an unveiling of something previously unknown. And now the genitive there, uh, the objective genitive, the source and the object of that revelation is Jesus Christ. Now, 
Sorry for geeking out on you from time to time, but, but when you combine the noun apocalypsis with the objective genitus, genitive Jesus Christ, what this is telling us in the Greek construction here is, is very, very um, powerful. It, it, it's saying this is a divine action of which Paul is the recipient, okay? Layman's terms, sure. The, the, the inspired text is saying here, Paul received this gospel from the direct revelation of Christ himself. Now, most of us know the story of Paul on the road to Damascus, right? An event that I would personally describe as earth-changing historically because the Lord used Paul to to what? To, To write the majority of the New Testament, okay? But when Paul goes autobiographical here, what we're also going to discover in a bit is Paul received, listen now, no instruction from the gospel concerning from any of the apostles, from none of the original 12 that lived with Jesus, did Paul receive any instruction. In fact, he's about to tell us of his first meeting with Peter for the very first time. Okay, what the inspired text is telling us is what Paul Norizzo really wants us to have crystal clear is Paul's gospel came not from men, but from direct revelation of God alone. Pay attention now, a manner of new revelation, secretly a new revelation, apocalypsis that, listen now, ceased with the apostolic age. Now, this is no small point, and so I want to make sure we understand this here, all right? Let's understand by way of review here how the canon of Scripture works, okay? Paul will later tell the Ephesians that the apostles and prophets were the, what, foundation of the household of God. Let's do a little review in Ephesians here. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the, notice there, household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. That word for foundation is themelios. That is a substructure that is put under a building, all right? It is a foundation. When you build a house, you don't build a foundation on top of the foundation, right? You build a building over the foundation. The foundation of the revealed word of God came through the prophets of the Old Testament and the apostles of the New Testament. That is the foundation, familios. You don't pull, you don't build another foundation on top of that. Now, what do you do on that foundation? What do you put on that foundation? Well, he tells the Ephesians, he answers that question a couple of chapters over uh, in chapter four. So Christ himself gave the apostles and the prophets, we just saw that, the Melios foundation, right? Christ gave the apostles and the prophets, well, what about the building? The evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ might be what? Built up, okay? We've just seen the foundation, the Themelios in chapter two, and now here we have the building, Okay, so understand, I know this is a quick summary of some uh, doctrine in Ephesians, but understand, God has given the church evangelists and pastors and teachers to build out and proclaim what the apostles and prophets revealed in the word of God. All right, it's not my job to come up here and give you new doctrine. I am simply here to proclaim the foundation that was built on the apostles and the prophets, the cornerstone of which was Christ. Now, why are you telling us all of this, Pastor? Well, a couple reasons. First of all, because Paul is a huge part of the New Testament foundation. Again, in fact, again, God used this man to write the majority of the New Testament, right? Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, and most likely Hebrews, all right? 
He is a huge part of this foundation. Now, the logistics of his learning from God are very interesting, and we're going to get to that in a minute. But again, what we need to know here is Paul's gospel came directly from God. God and not man. And you need to know that of the rest of the Bible because Paul was a huge part of the foundation. We're getting an object lesson in this argument for the inspiration of scripture here this morning. Okay. All right. Now, the second reason we're having a little talk here is because the church has become quite careless and quite cavalier in a very damaging way in our day with how she handles herself. There are a lot of misinformed and slash or somewhat goofy people in the church today who are always walking around saying, God told me. All right, I call this the God told me crowd. And this is a rather insidious infection that crept into the church through the charismatic stream. All right, people will approach you and say things like, God told me to tell you. Or, I have a word for you. Sound familiar? Oh, I have a word from the Lord for you. Uh, I've even heard, hey, hey, I am a prophet of God. And it is almost always a jumbled mass of confusion and inconsistencies and outright contradictions from the word of God because people that really know the word of God do not talk like that. Okay? Most of these people are seeking your attention. They want you to think they're very spiritual. Now, if you come to me and encourage me with a verse or a passage, awesome, man. Man, I need that. Remind me of what the Word of God says to me. But unfortunately, and it's not all ill-intended, right? It's not all malfeasant at all, right? Unfortunately, a lot of this charismatic language has crept into orthodox streams as well. And so you can have people that know sound doctrine that have imported unwittingly this, this really just bad stuff. Let me love you well, okay? And then I'm going to tell you why. If you are a person given over to saying, God told me this or that, please don't do that. You are not the 13th apostle, and you are making new believers think something is wrong with them. Hey, hey, why isn't God telling me these things? I mean, he's talking to you. Why is he not talking? Well, what's wrong with me here? Nothing. Stay normal. Okay? God speaks to you in volumes right here. When you speak of the things of God, hear me, church, speak Biblically, reverentially, rightly, and humbly. Hey, Brother Steve, man, I, I'm sorry you're going through this deal. Hey, here's some scriptures that really spoke to my heart when I was going through that. Man, man, I pray this blesses you. You see the difference? Now you're training younger believers as well. Okay, understand. Now here's what you need to understand. And this is the point Paul's making in Galatians. That to claim direct revelation from God to say, God told me, and I'm not saying you're doing this on purpose, but listen to me, to claim direct for revelation from God, which is what you're doing when you say, God told me, that is unwittingly putting yourself on equal footing with the word of God, which is the fountainhead from which all false teaching springs. Okay? This is how false teaching is born, through God told me. There is nothing new under the sun. Do not add or take away from this book. Okay? The prosperity gospel, for example, takes away from this book. The legalists want to add to this book. The liberalists want to take away from this book. The legalists want to add to this book. Stop saying God told me, knock it off. Okay? There are better ways to say that, hey, man, I, we, we didn't know where to go. I, I, you know, through prayer, through wisdom of the multitude of counsel, through seeking God, we feel like we were led to three rivers. Now you're training younger believers. Are you with me? And so look, be wise, be mindful, be biblical, be true. Edify your younger brothers and sisters in the Lord. Build them up, not in the goofy but in the glorious. Why? Ultimately, because we're not here to glorify ourselves. We're here to glorify God. You say, God told me. You are glorifying yourself. Don't do that. Okay? There's a better way. There's a biblical way. There's a reverential way that we ought to be conducting ourselves. 
Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, my brothers and sisters. We good? All right, I love you. We are not here to glorify ourselves. We're here to glorify God. All right. So Paul's gospel is not Paul's gospel at all. It's God's gospel given to him by God so that he would give you and I the lion's share of our new Testament. And so beginning in verse 13 now, he begins to lay out his credentials for the Galatian church. Just fascinating stuff, man. Love this with me. Verse 13. For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I, notice, used to persecute the church of God, notice further, beyond measure. Most of us know Paul Paul persecuted the church of God, but what we don't know is the extent to which he did it. Don't miss the text. I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure, and I tried to destroy it. Verse 14, and I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more, now now notice Paul's insight, notice again, being more what? Extremely zealous. Hear these terms, beyond measure. Extremely zealous. Extremely zealous for what, Paul? For my ancestral traditions. Extremely zealous for the word of God? No. Extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions traditions. All right, now two things that we need to grab here. Number one, Saul of Tarsus was a very sharp cat, all right? I mean, this guy was brilliant. His capacity was uncanny. Secondly, the damage to the church of Jesus Christ that this one man caused is incalculable. Let's go to his capacity first. And then we'll see the havoc he unleashed. And so we're going to take these two verses in reverse because I think it lays out the story a little bit better for us today. Now, every little Jewish kid went into the Jews' discipleship program in order to filter out who the future rabbis and leaders were to be, okay? Every little boy at the age of five, he was sent down to the local synagogue where they would sit under one of the local rabbis that they would memorize scripture, all right, they, they would write out scripture, they would be quizzed, they would have these um, didactic style Q&As where they were um, debating uh, all kinds of very interesting things. And, and the rabbis, they would have their radar set on high alert. All right, who now are the best young minds in our community? Now, the way it would work was within a year or two or three, if your boy was not one of the sharpest knives in the drawer, all right, you, you would get a visit from a local rabbi. He would say, now, mom and dad, uh, you, you know, you got a great kid here, just a wonderful boy, but, but we don't think he's going to make a living off his brain. All right, and so, so uh, he's going to need to make a living off his hands. And so, so why don't we get this boy in one of the trade schools? Right? And there was nothing wrong with that at all. It happened often. Interesting today, people in trades make more money than college graduates. Food for thought. Anyway, I digress. So nothing wrong with that at all. It happened often. Now, Paul's experience was the opposite of that. By the age of 13, he became known as a son of the law. Not a son-in-law, but as a son of the law. He was a brilliant little guy, and no doubt, at one day, one of the rabbis paid a visit to mom and dad, and they said, hey, your son, my, we have an absolute genius on our hands. We've never seen anything like it. We got to get this boy to the very best school we can. And so what did they do? They shipped him off down to Jerusalem, and this 13-year-old boy began to sit under the feet of Gamaliel, a living legend uh, at the time, literally a living legend. They called Gamaliel the beauty of the law because of the way that he spoke and the way that he taught and the way that he lived was said to beautify the law of God. And so get this kid's experience in your mind here. He's spending hour after hour day after day, like year after year, just memorizing massive chunks of scripture. The man had the entire book of Isaiah memorized. That's a feat. 
And so just year after year of, of growing in the law, he's debating and he's winning. He's just crushing his competition. He is so learned. And notice what he says to us there uh, in verse 14. He said, uh, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporary uh, contemporaries in history would suggest that as a very modest statement. The man went to the top of the line as a son of the law, unrivaled in his zeal for the law of God. You with me? Now, technically, mosaically, as we might say, the law of God was what? The first five books of the Old Testament, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Now, in the mind of the Jew, the Torah... The first five books, the Torah, was the law of God. Now, I don't know about your Bible, but I have got the first five books of the Bible on 331 pages. Okay, now I read from a study Bible, so you you probably have less than that, right? Now, Paul says here that he was, mark it here, extremely zealous for his, what, ancestral traditions. And again, I think that's probably an understatement as well. Now, what were those traditions? Well, we've talked about this uh, before, right? The Jews said, all right, we're going to write our interpretation of this law. And then we're going to write interpretations of our interpretations of the law. And now we're going to write commentaries on those interpretations of the interpretations. And, and now you've got the Mishnah, the Gemara, in, in the Jewish Talmud. Well, well, what I have on 331 pages, the Jews managed to codify into 535 books in 23 volumes. And Paul is saying here, those traditions, those 535 books, you are not going to find anybody that is more excited about that stuff than I was, right? Now, so what did he do with his great zeal? Okay, well, well, the story of Paul's conversion is told three times in the book of Acts 9, chapter 9, chapter 22, chapter 26. Now, he doesn't bring all of that in here. And so neither will we. But let's get a flavor for what this man of zeal did with his obsession with the law. Here are the very two first verses in Luke's account in Acts chapter 9. First two verses, first account. Watch this. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest, asked for letters from the synagogue, Uh, from him to the synagogue at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, what Christians were called before Antioch, Syria, where they were first called Christians, but before that, the way, uh, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem in order to be killed, all right? Now, that word for breathing there, it it really doesn't come into the English with the kind of impact that that I wish it would. But but this is empneo, and the idea in empneo is Paul is hell-bent upon, all right? He, he, He is animated by, this man is inhaling threats and murders against Christians. In other words, it's what he lives and breathes for, like this is his breath of life, right? Like it's why the dude gets up in the morning, all right? That's the idea behind Ephneo. Why? Well, because grace kills the law, right? Grace murders his zeal and murders his passion, and so he is now going to live and breathe to do violence against those whom he believes are doing violence to his precious ancestral traditions. Uh, here's one more, all we have time for, but, but this is from Paul's own testimony in Acts chapter 26. Listen to this. So then, Paul's telling his testimony here. I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not, not only did I lock up many of the saints in prison, having recently received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being 
put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues. I tried to force them to blaspheme. And being furiously enraged at them, I kept per- furiously enraged, extremely zealous. You know, just get, get the extremity of this man's personality. Furiously enraged at them, I kept pursuing them even to four cities. Do we understand what he is telling us here? All right? He is telling us, number one, I was putting them in prison. Number two, I was putting them to death. Number three, I was forcing them to recant. Do we understand? This dude was unhinged. All right? He is off the rails. This man went went absolutely mad in murder. He had set out to destroy the children of God from the face of the planet. This man was unhinged. Now, John Stott said something very interesting. He said this of Saul of Tarsus. Now, a man in that mental and emotional state is in no mood to change his mind or even to have it changed by men. No conditioned reflex or other psychological device could convert a man in that state. Here it is. Only God could reach him. And God did. Now that, to me, friends, is the greatest miracle in this story. And it's here for you by the sovereign will of God for a reason, okay? Can you possibly, can you possibly have a man further away from Christ than to be imprisoning and murdering his children No, you cannot. Now, we're going to do a little mental exercise here this morning. Okay? I want you to imagine in your mind, right now, close your eyes if you have to. I want you to imagine in your mind that lost family member. Maybe that black sheep in the fold. That coworker that's so obnoxious. That that friend who's really a great person, but they are diametrically opposed to the idea of God. Now, you got that individual in your head? You got them there? That family member that you think is so far gone, you've written them off, you got that person in your head? Okay, look right up at me. Here's the exercise. Who do you think is or was further away from the gospel? That person in your mind? Or Saul of Tarsus? Don't stop praying. Don't stop crying out to God. His arm is not too short. He is mighty to save. If he can get a hold, if God can get a hold of Saul of Tarsus, there is not one person within your sphere that is too hard for God to reach. It's why this narrative is here for you this morning. Don't stop praying. Don't allow your unbelief to limit the Holy One of Israel. All right. And so here is Paul, a very brilliant man, a very zealous man, a very pagan man, a very dangerous combination. But God, right? Like, but God. God, there's always but when God, right? Like, but God. Notice verse 15. With me? But God. But when God, who had set me apart even from my mother's womb, no small point there, and called me, underline called, called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me. Now, I'll stop there for a minute. Paul is saying that God set him apart and called him by grace where? In his mother's womb. Let's ask the question. 
all right? Had Paul done anything there inside of mama? Had Paul done so much as one work? Had he done one thing to somehow earn this call or standing before God? It's rhetorical. No, he had not. That's all election is, friends. Don't complicate it. God had determined before this man was born, before he did a thing to reveal his son to Saul of Tarsus. By the way, whose Roman name was Paul? Okay, let's keep reading. God was pleased to reveal his son to me. Why? Notice. Why was he called? Why was he saved? Notice now. That I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. He just keeps hammering that point home, right? Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. Like these people really need it just nailed down, don't they? Nor did I, the way he keeps repeating himself here is rather indicative and indictment upon his audience. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. I didn't do that. But now this is interesting. But I went away to Arabia. Somewhere near his home, uh, somewhere near his, uh, this town here of Damascus. I went away to Arabia, returned once more to Damascus. How long? Mark verse 18. Three years later, hadn't met an apostle. Hadn't seen a soul that traveled with Jesus. Three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to renew my acquaintance? No, to become acquainted with Cephas. This is Peter, and Paul is meeting him for the first time here. All right? And stayed with him for 15 days. Boy, I hope they got that on Vimeo. But I did not see any of the other apostles either, right? Except James, the Lord's brother. Now, in what I am writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. Only a very weak-minded, fickle people would need this reminder. Am I right? All right. Now, you think about this. Here is this brilliant little man. By the way, the the name Paul means little. It means small. It means humble. Okay, here's this guy, and he is out there in the Arabian desert for three years before he ever meets his first apostle, right? The text is very clear here and will be in chapter two as well. This man, again, had received no apostolic instruction from the original 12. He learned nothing from men. So this is fascinating. Here's Paul. All right, everybody go home, man. I, man, I got to figure this deal out. I'm going to head over that sand dune over there for a few years. All right, I'll see you later. Now, now, here's the part that's just wild to think about. Imagine now you've got this brilliant little zealous man, and God is now rewiring him personally over these three years in the Arabian desert. And remember, he's born again, right? And Ananias laid hands on him after God knocked him over on the Damascus road. And and then Ananias said, "Uh, brother Saul, receive your sight. Be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Acts 9, 17. And so this guy, no doubt he's born again, grabbed every scroll he could possibly get his hands on, large swaths of which he had committed to memory, right? And, And he is now out there in the Arabian desert for three years being schooled and humbled by the Lord. (laughs) Imagine what this man saw. Like, what was that like? Right? He's going through Habakkuk too. Oh, the just shall live by faith. Uh, Oh my, there it is. He's going through the Old Testament. There's Christ. There's Christ. There's Christ again over there. There's Christ. Oh my, Abraham sacrificing his only son. What a picture. And would you look at this? Genesis 15 and verse 6. Abraham believed and God credited to him as righteous. The whole time it's been about grace. I didn't see it. This is too wonderful. And you could just imagine, Paul, there's Jesus over there. There's Jesus there. There's Jesus again. The the man is seeing the whole picture come together as no man before him and since has been taught of the Lord. I'm really tempted to sneak Spurgeon into a close second, but no man has ever been instructed of the Lord like this. And yet, and yet, and this is good news. That very same discovery awaits all of you. If you will just get in the word of God, it is an 
infinite treasure chest that no man in 10,000 lifetimes could possibly mine. Because he is infinite as are his treasures. Now, notice here, that God revealed his son to Paul, okay? God revealed his son to Paul. Why? That he might preach him among the Gentiles, right? Now, just as Peter, some of you know this, we'll get to this next week in chapter two as well, but just as Peter was called to be the apostle to the Jews, Paul is now being the apostle called to the Gentiles. Either way, what I want you to grab here is that, the, listen now, the call to be saved is always accompanied by a call to serve. All right? God does not call any person to salvation that he does not call to some measure of service in his kingdom. Ephesians 2, right? You know this. We were created in Christ Jesus for good works. There's your service, which God pr pr prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. Now, now, I don't know how God has gifted you in the natural, all right? But he has done so in order that you may flourish in the family of God that you might be blessed, but also that you might be a blessing. No one has been called of God to salvation that is not called to serve his kingdom. Now, come and find Nate or Danny or I if we can help you become more connected to this family. We will find a lane for you to drive your gifting through, all right? But make no mistake about it. The, the call to be saved is always accompanied by a call to serve in some fashion or, or, or you're missing. You're, you're missing it. You're, your own flourishing is going to be the poorer for it. Get connected in some way. Well, we're happy to come alongside you and try and figure out what that looks like for you. All right. Well, notice finally this morning then, verse 21. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia. These are regions within the Roman Empire. He's not hanging around in Judea. Doesn't need to do that, right? You got Peter there uh, ministering to the Jews. Notice verse 22. I was still unknown uh, by sight to the churches of Judea, who were, uh, which were in Christ, but only they kept hearing. What were they hearing about Paul? He who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith which he once tried to destroy. And notice they were, here's where we should end, notice they were glorifying God because of me. That's what it's all about. And when is God glorified? When you're most satisfied in him. How do you become more satisfied in him? You become a student of his word. You become a practitioner of prayer. You develop fellowship within the body. And you get plugged in and be part of it. You serve. And God will be glorified through you. All right? So notice Paul, he's up and running here. He doesn't go to the churches in Judea, but rather his focus is upon penetrating regions of the Roman Empire in order to win Gentile converts to Christ. Now, now contrary to what some believe, God never changed Saul's name to Paul. Do you understand that? That is a misrepresentation of the truth. God never changed Saul's name to Paul. This is not a Cephas Peter deal at all, right? Saul was his Hebrew name which the Lord still used after his conversion. Paul is his Roman name, which he used because he was penetrating regions within the Roman Empire for the gospel. Okay? I just thought you should know that. Uh, Paul is not a converted name. It's just the same Roman name for Saul. Now, notice how the chapter wraps up here. We just talked about it. He says in verse 24, they were glorifying God because of me. He didn't say, 
He didn't say they were glorifying him because he was some superhuman rule-keeping Pharisee signing autographs in the streets in Judea. No, the churches were glorifying God because they're looking at Paul. Would you look at what God has done? Can you even believe it? I mean, the Lord took a mad, murderous, rule-loving, pagan Christian killer and fashioned of him an apostle, a pastor, a preacher, a teacher to take the glory of the gospel to the Gentile world. Well, how did he do that? Well, he did it the very same way that he does with you and me. The man's life had been changed by the power of the grace of God plus the works that he did. Somebody correct me or I'm going to come out there and exercise you. All right? The man had been changed by the power of the grace of God alone. The man's life had been changed by the power of the grace of God. And what you need to understand, friends, is that not only are our lives changed by grace, but they are sustained by by grace, okay? Not only are you saved by grace, but you are sanctified by marveling over that very same grace. You see, what sanctification, what maturity in the Lord ultimately comes down to is God giving you better affections. Better than what has your attention today. And the way that he gives you better affections is by revealing his glory to you through the person and works of Christ by his spirit as you study his word. And as he progressively and gently reveals and meets out his glory to you over time, you're going to see more and more of who he is. The most beautiful, excellent, magnificent, exceedingly valuable treasure in all of the universe. And it is on your way to seeing more of that that these lesser affections begin to fall off of you and you are changed. It all begins and it is all sustained by marveling over the gospel of grace that Paul is going to aggressively defend here in Galatians. It's all about grace, VXV. It is all about grace. And so we come full circle now to what we said in our introduction to Galatians. Let's land the plane. What is the purpose of the gospel? Well, they just told us in verse 24 that we might what? Glorify God. God works, changes your life. He brings about a total transformation of your heart, and we respond by glorifying God. So where do we end up again? Right? God works. We worship. That is the plan of God for your life. And now here is, I believe, the word of the Lord for VXV Church this week based upon this text. Don't seek to please men. Seek to please God. Don't seek your own glory. Seek his. Don't hold yourself up. Exalt him. Be careful how you talk to people. May the Lord not find us the way the Apostle Paul found this church in Galatians, a weak-minded, 
fickle people wandering too easily away from the gospel. Let us be humble. Let us be mindful. Let us, brothers and sisters, stay strong in the grace of God. Don't wander away from the gospel. Stay strong in the grace of God and it will be well with your soul. When the churches looked at the Apostle Paul, what did they do? They glorified God. And maybe, just maybe, the question the Lord would have you to ask yourselves this morning is, does the church glorify God when they look at you and me? Take that question to the Lord in prayer and pray about the answer that comes back to you. He has more for you. Doctrine matters. Grace matters. Truth matters. The authority of the word of God matters. And if you will embrace the message that Paul has for us in Galatians, it will be well with your soul. Now, now, for anyone that has yet to embrace Christ, I want to close with a story from the life of Christ by way of Dr. John Piper. And I think this brings home Galatians for the uncommitted soul, okay? In the very last week of his life, the Jews came to Jesus and said this. When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him while he was teaching and said, by what authority, that's what we're dealing with here in Galatians, right? By what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, well, well, now wait a minute. I will also ask you one thing, which if you tell me, then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, from what source? Was it from heaven? Or was it from men? And they began reasoning among themselves, saying, well, if we say from heaven, he's going to say to us, well, then why did you not believe him? But if we say from men, oh, we fear the people. They all regard John as a prophet. And answering Jesus, they said, We do not know. And he also said to them, well then, neither will I tell you by what authority you do these things. Listen to me. It's a question of authority, isn't it? And I believe this morning, Jesus is saying this to you whom are uncommitted. Okay? The gospel that Paul preaches, is it from heaven? Or is it from men? Hear him ask you this question personally, my uncommitted friend. And man, I'm so glad you're here to hear his word to you this morning. Maybe you haven't come to Christ because you feel like he hasn't answered your questions about life and the world and how this all works. Maybe things don't make sense to you. But as Dr. Piper reminds us, quote, God will not be badgered from the grandstand of agnosticism and indifference. And so this morning, God says to you, my uncommitted committed friend whom I love, God says to you, now look, I have a question for you. You tell me the answer to my question, and I will be happy to answer all of yours. The gospel that Paul preaches, salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and not by anything that you do, is this gospel from heaven? Or from men. It ain't from men. What are you going to do? Today, today is the day of salvation. Come and see me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for your life-giving word. Thank you in this massive object lesson for us who believe 
that what we are reading, what we are studying, what we are seeking to understand is from you. This is your word. This is not of men. This is your revelation, God, to us because you love us in ways that we're incapable of loving ourselves. So God, I thank you for this gospel so beautiful that you've done all the heavy lifting that God, all we bring to the table is our sin that you might forgive and that you might set us on a path of better affections and that this whole life, this whole journey of sanctification is us dismissing the lesser for the greater. Each one of us has steps to make in that regard, God, and I pray you would reveal to my brothers and sisters whom I love what that next step might be. Have your way with our hearts, and God, I pray for those who are uncommitted, who have yet to bend the knee to Christ to understand that this gift, this free gift, Christians be praying that this free gift of salvation is based upon what you have done, not what we have done. Ours is only to say, yes, it hasn't worked my way. I just don't know. I am ready, God, to receive who it is that you are and what you would have to do. Come into my life, Lord. Take me under your wing. I want to confess that you died for my sins and, Lord, that you were resurrected, that I might be reconciled to you, that I might start over with a clean heart and pursue you. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, man. You just pray that in the quietness of your own heart, and you come and see me. And I, along with an innumerable host of angels, will be throwing a party for you. And we'll get you going. We'll get you on this track. We love you. Thank you, God, for your word. And continue to prepare us for this astonishing journey you have set us upon. May we delight in you more than when we walked in here this morning. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. And the people of God said, let's worship. Amen.